Well, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Jan Krychek speaking today, uh, in spite of the time changes, and apologize for California being off from Europe, or from the US being off from Europe. Uh, Jan's worked extensively in logic and complexity, um, especially I would say in bounded arithmetic and, prof and propositional proof, proof complexity. Uh, he's at the Charles, U Charles University, and he's speaking today about information efficiency and proof systems. So, okay, so. thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the invitation to join your seminar, at least in this way. Obviously, I am not that qualified to even make the start of the seminar, but uh, fortunately, you waited, so thank you very much. Uh, one, I see that one advantage of being a speaker is that I see that there is actually some audience. In the earlier seminars I attended, it, it's very lonely experience because it's just the speaker, the host, and then myself. And one can only guess whether there are some other people or not. So this is uh, rather nice. Now, <clears throat> the thing I want to talk about, I, I noticed that in past seminars in this sort of say, series, at least, uh, a lot of people talk often about uh, you know, surveying some particular method or some development of, of the field and so on. And I'm not really going to do that. I, what, I, what I want to talk about is certain problem and certain thinking about a certain problem about which I thought for time to time in the last few months. I started with one problem which I thought could lead to something new. Then I found out that this can be actually uh, quite reasonably answered using very classical parts of true complexity. But along the way, I stumbled upon one notion and uh, one problem about it, which I think would be of interest. And uh, in particular, I don't know how to solve it. So <clears throat> that's what I want to talk about. So it's not really a survey of anything, but I hope uh, you don't mind. So I plan to spend two or three slides, just uh, basic definition, because I'm not sure if everybody is uh, proof complexity theorist and also just to fix the notation. So the <clears throat> so I'll take the functional definition of uh, Cook uh, Reghold's version of the propositional proof systems, namely being it a polynomial time function whose range is exactly the set of propositional tautologies in some fixed language and fixed format, for example, the Morgan formulas or the CNF formulas and so on. Now the fundamental problem they, they pointed out is whether there exists a proof system where the <coughs> uh, lengths of proofs can be bounded by a polynomial. So the lengths of proof function, I'll denote by this uh, symbol at the bottom of the slide, and it measures how fast or rather how short proofs a proof system P allows for formulas. And the questions they, uh, and the observations they, of course, immediately made was that such a proof system exists if and only if the class MP is closed under complementation. And therefore, this is kind of a fundamental problem. Now, one hears uh, from time to time mentioning of Cook's program to P versus NP. I'm not sure if he would be happy with people saying that it's a program, but it is a certain approach rather than solving P versus MP, you try to solve a harder problem and P versus MP, but also in a bit different environment, namely in some logic and logical calculi for proof systems, which bring in some structure, which is maybe not available for algorithms directly. Anyway, so this is basic one. Basic two is that we, we can use this length of proof function to compare <laughs> two proof systems and define not, it's not a partial ordering, but it's a quasi ordering. So <clears throat> you say that P is as good as Q if it's at most polynomial is slower than any, than, than a proof system Q. And the more efficient way of this, then the translation of the proof can be performed by polynomial time algorithm. So this uh, quasi ordering by P simulation is finer than the quasi ordering just by uh, <coughs> proof length, but uh, in many respects, it doesn't really matter which of uh, them you have. Or more precisely, when one shows that something is not <coughs> uh, quasi-ordered, then it's usually in the non-uniform version, the first one, 
And when you say that something can be simulated, then often it, it comes with the effective piece simulation. Okay. Now, the second uh, fundamental problem is the optimality problem. Namely, if in these quasi ordering there are maximal elements, something which would be optimal with respect to, to proof length. And uh, <coughs> this is the last uh, kind of basic slide. Uh, this optimality problem is really surprising to how many different areas of combinatorics and complexity theory and logic it relates in quite genuine way that the existence of such a <coughs> ideal uh, object, the optimal proof system, can be characterized in, in completely different language. So I personally, I like uh, in some sense most the characterization using the quantitative Gödel's theorems, the incompleteness theorem, where you don't just, just say that something is or is not provable, but you uh, pay attention to the lengths of proofs in, in theories. Okay. Now, there are also some surprising results, or maybe surprising to when you see them for the first time, namely that relative to a theory, under some mild condition on the theory, there is actually such an optimal proof system. And there is also an optimal proof system among proof systems where you allow some advice. For example, if you allow advice one bit, then among all such proof systems, there is one which is uh, optimal in this respect. So relative to a theory, that means that you look only at proof systems which are provably sound in the theory. Okay. Now, uh, the, the problem I, I was interested in is uh, what can one say about the complexity or about the optimality of some way to searching for propositional proofs. So, <clears throat> so I'll define a proof search algorithm in propositional logic to be a pair where P is a propositional proof system. A is a deterministic algorithm that you can require stops on all inputs. That's without loss of generality, with only little increase in time, and finds p proofs for all tautologies. <laughs> so, using this functional definition of proof systems, it's uh, it's really like an inverse function to p. So <clears throat> that's co quite succinct. Uh, presentation of the condition, I think. Okay. So we don't really care what it does on input which are not tautologies. Okay. So the informal question is whether whether there is actually an optimal way how to an optimal proof search algorithm in any sensible quasi ordering of the proof systems. Now I'm sure that this uh, has to occur to everybody. And uh, I would have rather liked if it turned out that the answer is yes, and P was some rather weak system. You see something like little over resolution or resolution combined with some geometric or algebraic proof system or some algebraic proof system, something in which is kind of uh, <coughs> towards the bottom of the quasi ordering of proof systems. Because that would, uh, in some sense, explain why. It, why it doesn't make why it doesn't help to search for proofs in strong proof systems and uh, it could also in some sense it would also justify that uh, looking for algorithms often means looking for algorithms aiming at proofs in the same proof system rather than trying to improve also the proof system now, I don't know if these uh, remarks or in these informal thoughts make such a much sense because, uh, you know, I informally think uh, about algorithms and how to compare them without actually knowing much theory how general algorithms are to be compared. But uh, I'm slightly suspicious that there is not really that much theory. So anyway, here seems to be a natural quasi ordering by time. So similarly as the quasi-ordering for proof system, here you say that the, that the proof search algorithm AP is, say, time-wise at least as good as BQ. If the time is at most polynomially 
longer than the time of B. Okay? So note that I, I compare proof systems which may search for proofs in different proof systems. That a priori doesn't, that the, the quasi ordering makes sense in the general sense. Now there, are, there is a lemma and a theorem. <coughs> and the lemma is uh, just the observation that the universal search in, in the sense of Levin gives you an algorithm which for any fixed proof system you, you have a time optimal algorithm among all proof search algorithms with the same uh, target proof system. So this is, um, I'm sure that there are sophistic, more sophisticated ways how to define it so that the time is really the minimal possible. But basically you for I going from one, two, three and so on, you, you try lexicographically first I deterministic algorithms for I steps and you check whether you have by any chance found the P proof of the formula. And this, this check is polynomial time because P is a polynomial time function. And so you can recognize when one of the algorithm actually found an answer and that will be the output of your <coughs> algorithm. And it's, uh, and uh, it has at most polynomial slowdown over any algorithm. Okay. So in, in, in a sense, uh, <coughs> if you, if you fix P resolution, then there is simply the best way how to search for resolution proofs. Of course, it's not the way how any anybody who actually does the searching would opt to do, you know, to, to cycle through other algorithms and try all of them and so on. But theoretically, this is uh, uh, optimal way how to do it, at least in the sense of this quasi ordering. Now, the theorem, I just uh, it's it's also not difficult, but it's not just uh, observation that. Uh, if you take a proof system, which essentially you would just require that it has two properties, that it simulates resolution, and that if you substitute for some variables constants, then the resulting uh, formula can be proved essentially by the same size as the original formula, or at most with a polynomial slowdown. Okay? So under this assumption, the proof system is p-optimal, if and only if this uh, unique proof search algorithm, which which is the optimal algorithm AP searching for P proofs, is time optimal and, and now it's among all proof search algorithms, irrespective of what is the proof system <coughs> uh, they use. Okay? So I interpret this theorem as saying that this proof search problem, which I thought first could lead to some kind of new new facet of proof complexity is actually no new problem at all. So <clears throat> I will at the end uh, give some reference uh, to a manuscript, to a preprint where I wrote these things. And this has a, a couple of proofs. One is using just the classical proof theory, uh, proof complexity. Another actually uses a result which we proved with Pavel some 30 years ago, uh, <coughs> which related the existence of P-optimal uh, proof system with the existence of a with the existence of a deterministic algorithm computing the characteristic function of tautologies in a way that is time optimal on tautologies. So <clears throat> that can be used to prove this as well. And I'm not going to talk it. I don't think it's really that interesting. Now. I had uh, these informal doubts whether this time quasi ordering is actually the the right one. Now, namely, I would I am I would be curious if you can define some other quasi ordering which would be, you know, arguably natural or sensible, where the optimality in this quasi ordering does not actually reduce to the p optimality problem for proof systems. Now you should always have that the time comp that if if some algorithm is at least as good time wise, then it is at least as good in any quasi ordering because so uh, in, in the language of orderings it's the finest one. But what if it is not actually <laughs> at least as good? What if you you have a algorithm which is say strictly stronger in this quasi ordering? 
Now, this may happen for various kind of silly reasons. For example, this AP can really be just BQ, except that the algorithm A remembers some very uniform set of formulas which have long Q proofs. And for these specific formulas, it remembers, it will declare that the formulas themselves are proofs for themselves. So P is really just Q, except that for a polynomial time set of tautologies, it has extra proofs. And A is really just the B, except that it remembers a sparse and simple set of tautologies, which happen to be hard for Q. So I, I don't really know whether it's uh, sensible to claim that the algorithm AP is actually stronger if, if this is what's going on. And so I was thinking if there would be some way how to compare the algorithms on tautologies, on inputs, where they actually do something non-trivial, whatever that is. Now, in, I had few thoughts like this, and I didn't really get anywhere. Except I got it, it, it brought me to the notion I want to explain in a moment. And I basically convinced myself that this theorem from the previous slide is a good answer to the proof search problem. But, uh, uh, or rather like that, that the doubts one uh, I express here are, you can probably express about any class of algorithm searching, solving any type of problems. And I think it's probably. Uh, very dependent on the purpose of the algorithms and uh, you know, what is considered in that community or in that class of problems important and what not and so on. And I really didn't want it to get into it. And I also don't think that one can actually prove something general in this respect. But in any case, I, I thought first that I should not really reveal how naive question I have been posing to myself. But then I thought, uh, why not? Because it leads to something which is actually formal thing. So it's not just informal. Okay, so here is a definition, <coughs> uh, which is a certain complexity measure of a proof system. So given a proof system, I, uh, you, you define a function which to a tautology assigns a natural number. And the natural number is this uh, relative Kolmogorov complexity uh, of a proof relative to knowing tau. Okay? So let me remind uh, people what this, uh, how, how this is defined. So you look at the, at the pairs machine E, which computes W from input U in time at most T. And uh, such a pair, machine E and time T, uh, co contributes the length of E and log of plus the log of time is its cost, and you look at the minimal cost of such a thing. So this is a version of Kolmogorov complexity due to Levin time-bounded version. There are <coughs> apparently really very many versions of of mod how how the Kolmogorov complexity can be modified to incorporate time, and uh, but uh, this seems to me be the most sensible, or at least in this context. Now, for a tautology of size m, and uh, under some mild condition on, on p, you have the following bounds on this information. So it is at most m, and the reason for it is that you need something like 2 to the m time to produce by some canonical algorithm, the truth table proof in a, in a proof system. And on the other hand, it has to be at least log of the minimal size of a proof because you need the length of a proof, time of the length of a proof to write it down. And the minimal length is uh, if we assume that the proof has at least the length of the formula, so it's lower bounded by log m. Okay? So this is the range in which this formula, this value happens. Now here are two lemmas which in some sense are analogous to what I was saying before. So first of all, you can use this to actually lower bound time any algorithm which will search for a proof of, of, uh, of the tautology will have to use. And the calculation is very simple. Simply from the definition, you have these inequalities. And therefore, the time A has to use is 
some constant which depends on a times two to the i. So so up to this multiplicative constant, two to the information complexity of tau is actually the minimal time which any algorithm has to use. Okay. And the second lemma I kind of personally call information automatizability, namely that there is actually an algorithm which does use essentially the time or polynomially slower and which computes the uh, the proof with the minimal information content. Okay. So the first thing is just from this inequality, and the second thing is another version of this universal search, uh, where you simply search for over all pairs, uh, algorithm E and time T up to the cost one, two, three up to I, and, and you eventually find the, the the proof of the minimal such information cost. Okay. So, but it has the I think it has the feature which is kind of opposite to automatizability which doesn't seem to hold which never holds so here you can interpret this as saying that it always holds in this respect okay so uh, I don't know if there are any questions uh, I don't mind if people interrupt me uh, with some questions okay so what about uh, information versus size so we had this uh, lower this bottom inequality so uh, if you have a uh, it could happen that this middle inequality is actually strict and that the discrepancy between log of size and the information might be very big and so this this question is whether the information complexity can give you a better time lower bound for the algorithms than size normally in at least i think that usually people when you have when you are proving that some procedure for sat solving uh, requires so much time then what you are doing is that you are lower bounding the time by the size of resolution or some other proofs it has to produce okay. but uh, in principle it can happen that that I, the information is more than proportional to log of log of the size, and the question is whether this can happen. And the observation is that this is actually exactly the characterization that P is non-automatizable, and that fortunately is almost always the case, right? I was rather skeptical, <laughs> to, or rather skeptical. I simply like on automatizability, not automatizability, but the non-automatizability and the fact that it gives some kind of positive face to the fact when feasible interpolation fails. But uh, now the fact that uh, uh, basically nothing complete is automatizable, right, except maybe one or two exceptions, means that this discrepancy can actually happen for essentially any complete proof system. Okay. So uh, here is a just a calculation how one can go about uh, thinking about automatizability in these terms. So for the purpose of this and next slide, I will consider that my formula has size m, and I will say that the, uh, that some quantity is small if it is on, on the order of log m. And it is large otherwise, and a string is simple if its complexity is small, and complex if its Kolmogorov uh, complexity is large. Okay. Now, so if you want to witness the discrepancy between time and space, uh, times and size, sorry, information and size, then it must necessarily happen that all proofs are actually complex because of this <coughs> last but one inequality on this page and so you want proofs where you want for the purpose of separating size from time from information you want uh, formulas which have short proofs but all proofs are complex okay. now a convenient way how to express this property and which holds actually also for, for which which simply makes sense for any formulas is uh, is to define this red quantity 
i t tau uh, and pi which is uh, it's a quantity which uh, Kolmogorov already defined in his uh, you know paper in 60s about of course not time bounded complexity but the original one and he calls this information that tau conveys about pi so <clears throat> if you look at it it's simply if this is small it means that if you know tau it doesn't help you much it doesn't give you much information about pi namely in order to produce pi you still need almost as such information as if you are producing pi without any without knowing any tau okay. so this is uh, <coughs> the quantity and now uh, <coughs> if we find such formulas which are actually themselves simple, like the instances of, of some reflection principle or something like that, then in fact, automatically this quantity has to be small because formula being simple means that this KT complexity of tau at the last but one line on this slide is of the order O log O, o log. And the, the, then there is some kind of error terms which are uh, just log size. So the error terms comes from the fact that if you have a, <coughs> a if, if you know what is information cost to producing tau and what is information cost of producing pi from tau, the cost of producing pi is not just the sum of the previous two, but plus some small log term size error okay. so this is computed in more detail in the paper but this is what, uh, what in principle you would want okay. now here is an example which i take from our which i just modified in a sense the and something which we did with pavel about extended resolution and rsa that uh, how to construct formulas which do have this property explicitly so you define a formula which says that if uh, if x is the pre-image of b in some one-way permutation then the hard bit you compute from x has to be the actual hard bit uh, which uh, which is determined by little b okay so uh, it's easy to see that uh, this has uh, short proofs because if you can prove that it is a permutation that it is one to one then it then, then to prove this you just need to take the pre-image plug it in and compute that the bit has the right value the hard bit has the right value and because you know that it is one to one the one pre-image you found is the only one there is okay. and on the other hand if you could uh, if you could uh, construct proofs of this if the information you needed for that was a little, then then by this e-automatizability, you could construct these proofs in polynomial or polynomial time, and that would simply allow you to compute what the hard bit is in polynomial time, because you would know whether or not this formula is a tautology or not. And so, assuming <coughs> that it is a one-way permutation and that in your proof system you can prove that it is one way then this gives you an example of formulas for which uh, that inequality is satisfied okay so uh, you know, other proofs for other proof systems can lead to some other examples okay. now one thing is that i am not quite happy with this example and these arguments because the if you want to separate size from information you necessarily have to prove that p is different from np because it basically means that there is some short object namely the proof which is easy to recognize namely by the proof system but it's not easy to find it because the information required is bigger than than logarithm and so if you have such examples, their analysis and the proof have to use some conjectures which implies that P is different from NP. So in the ideal case, P is different from NP itself. 
like uh, in the work of uh, Albert and Moritz, and uh, in some other cases, some other conditions. But uh, I would like uh, if one could simply treat this information measure in the same way as the size measure, namely uh, for individual formulas. You see, so we have uh, lower bound, say, for pigeonhole principle in some proof systems, and of course, this lower bound has some constant in it, and uh, so you can express it that for n, the size of something has to be 2 to the n to 1 over 3 or whatever. But in principle, you don't have to, it doesn't matter that the formula is a part of some ambient uniform sequence. You simply have one pigeonhole principle formula for one n, and you do, you apply the method, random restrictions or whatever, and then the adversary argument against the resulting simplified proof or some other method, and you come up with a number, and it just does not depend on whether you consider the formula of being part of some ambient sequence. So I asked myself for, for what do what do we actually use lower bound for in, in proof system? So one thing is of course that we would like to show that nothing is P bounded and so eventually show in this way that NP is the true from coin P. Other things are the the topic which is probably uh, closest to hearts of, of the um, program participants, namely that uh, you can use it to time lower bound sub algorithms which are simulated by the proof systems. So, in particular, if the proof system gets a little bit stronger, then <coughs> all those algorithms whose soundness can be proved there, then <coughs> uh, the time lower bound will follow. So, in some sense, you can you look at it that you are proving instances of p different from NP, namely you are ruling out a certain classes of sub algorithms. And finally, the, and uh, <coughs> at least I think quite importantly, there are also independence results for the bounded arithmetic theories attached to P. And in particular, you show that P is different from NP is consistent with this theory. Now. I, I'm not sure if logic is uh, something, uh, you know, it, it didn't seem to be part of your proof complexity bootcamp, so I don't really want to talk about this three, but uh, at least this last line that you are showing certain consistency is, I think, of interest. Now, the point is that, in fact, to do this, you don't need size lower bounds. Information lower bounds are just as good. So assume I actually managed to prove what corresponds to super polynomial size of the bounds. Namely, I proved that I will have some infinite class of formulas, or I can produce arbitrarily large formula tau, such that its information efficiency function is, is more, it cannot be bounded by constant time slope size. Okay. Now, if you have this, then it is essentially as good as having super polynomial size lower bound because it in the first case it doesn't you know if you would have that for all proof systems it would not imply that mp is different from qnp but it would imply that either it is different or p is different from mp and we are happy with that right it also implies time lower bounds for sub algorithms that was the lemma one i stated before and it also implies the independence results because the independence results are obtained by propositional translations. The argument is that if something has a proof, then in fact, <laughs> sorry, first order proof, then its propositional translation has short proofs, and so lower bounds gives you independence. But in fact, these propositional translations are performed by polynomial time algorithms often, and so. It's it's not about existence of short proofs, but it's actually how you can construct them. So information is just as useful. And so it led me to the following problem, which I think is is a sensible problem to at least understand whether it's sensible or not and possibly solve it. Namely, prove such lower bounds, but unconditional. Give examples of formula style and prove unconditional lower bounds of this form for the information efficiency. And ideally for a proof system for which we have no super polynomial size lower bounds. 
Now, if we don't manage this, then at least prove such size to our bounds for proof system, which we you know seem to know a lot about resolution or constant defrag or whatever. But for formulas for which you do not have size lower bounds, so prove simply this information lower bound instead. Okay, and one should keep in mind that you you should rather expect that the e hard information hard formulas, the formulas which would witness this uh, uh, inequality, should have long proofs, because if you also manage to find them such that they have short proofs, then you are actually proving that p is different from n p, and therefore you are likely to have to use some hypothesis in the proof. Therefore, if you want unconditional lower bound, one should really aim at formulas which have long proofs. But the point is that I want the information lower bound not to be derived from the size of the proofs, but by some other means. Okay. Now let me give just two candidates. The, the first candidate is the uniform, which might be just reflection formulas for some proof system which we think should be stronger than P. Now, it, it would have the advantage that these formulas are simple in the Kolmogorov sense. Their complexity is about log m, because they are efficiently produced once you are given the length m. But on the other hand, they are just too general. Everything can be somehow reduced to them. And so it's doubtful whether one can avoid using some hypothesis in it. Okay. Now, also, maybe one, one should uh, uh, so consider reflection formulas not with respect to uh, not saying that proofs of size at most m are sound, but that proofs whose complexity say at most log m are sound. Um, well, I don't know. I just wanted to mention that this is a class of uniform formulas and therefore simple in the Kolmogorov sense, which could be ho hopeful. Uh, the, the second set of non-uniform candidates are these uh, uh, formulas where you take a function which uh, takes input with n bits and produces more bits. And therefore, most n bit strings will not be in the range of, of the function. And the formula says exactly this, that b is not in the range of the function. So here, the y variables are some kind of auxiliary variables that help you to write down the computation. And a simple observation is that if Z is actually a pseudorandom generator, then in fact you have the lower bound. But uh, this is an observation of no help to the problem because you are of course not allowed to use this hypothesis that something is pseudorandom. So one should look at specific functions which were uh, considered for the purpose of these tau formulas having long proofs and uh, cases where we were not able to prove it and try to prove it at least for the information. So I'm hoping that this might stimulate some kind of lower bound um, method which would be different. Okay, so I'm to the last but one slide. I just wanted to mention that there are quite a few topics in proof complexity which I think are somehow related, namely that they more or less explicitly or implicitly contain some uh, compression or decompression functions, simply some proofs which are somehow compressed or in the argument you use some compression for for proofs or formulas and so on. So some of this is treated in the paper, but uh, uh, not all of them. So anyway, I'm running out of time. So this is the last slide. So I just want to point out that I have a preliminary version of a draft of this stuff on my web page. And uh, not everything which is which I mentioned today is there, but uh, there ought to be some revision soon. And I have mentioned quite a few uh, proof complexity results, and <clears throat> if you want to, uh, you know, find the background, you can maybe find it in this book in, with, in the index there. Okay, so thank you very much for attention, and uh, sorry again to be one hour late. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'll clap on everybody's behalf since we can't clap in the ordinary sense.
Uh, we have some time for questions and uh, please either just break in and speak out or type into the chat window or the Q&A window. Um, so maybe while people are thinking about questions or something like that, I could ask something though. Uh, about somewhere back about five or six slides, you said that in, in, in that lower bounds on information complexity were just as useful. Uh, yeah. And I was just wondering, could you, so I guess you didn't mention, I think the previous slide mentioned NP not equal to co-NP is one of the co consequences. Could that also follow from? Yeah, well, what, what uh, follows here is that you either show that the proof system is not P-bounded, and maybe none of them are, and then it does. But if it is P-bounded and you have the lower bounds and you are showing that P is different from NP. So, so, so this is, uh, just as good means that in this first case, I would have to compromise a little bit and rather than getting this inequality, one would get that P is different from NP. And, and I didn't... In, in, in items two and three, I think you don't have to compromise at all. And so I guess that means that we, it's gonna be extremely difficult to find unconditional lower bounds on in, information and complexity. Well, yes, but uh, it will be, it, it would be, but it cannot be more difficult than for size, right? And so therefore it could be doable for those proof systems for which we do not have size, unconditional size lower bounds. Or for the proof systems where we do have such size lower bounds, but not for formulas well, you know, for some formulas you would want them, but you do not have the lower bound. So maybe one could at least get the, this information lower bound. I don't know. I mean, this, uh, I, I think, uh, I think that simply the, the setup of this or this, that this <coughs> uh, measure is somehow more, uh, a, first of all, you have this lemma too, which I call information automatizability. And when, once you have information automatizability, you of course have something like information interpolation in some sense. And uh, if you formulate it in just the most straightforward way, it's not very helpful, but there might be some more sophisticated ways how to, to formulate it. So there might be a way how to use this measure to actually extract from proof some kind of other computational information than it is extracted by feasible interpolation. That's what I would be interested in most. But, uh, you know, rather than saying this vague problem, I think that this, this problem is simply well-defined and challenging, I think, at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I have a question. So, uh, can you remind us uh, how the existence of an optimal proof system affects the theory? Mm. You started with that, but I, I mean, the concepts yeah, are new. Let me, let me. Moment. So do you mean the thing which I say here at the bottom or? Well, that would be the second question. But the question, suppose there is an optimal proof system. What uh, does it, make to the theory? I mean, to, does it trivialize or the contrary? Well, no. You mean the theory attached to it? No, no, no. Uh, I mean the theory of information complexity, the one you're introducing. Oh, the... I see. So, uh, no. I mean, it would show that the information efficiency function is optimal for this p-optimal proof system because the p-optimality... Okay, so that's... Uh, so. Okay, so so I can order two proof systems P and Q by saying that the information efficiency function for P is not bigger than Q up to a multiplicative constant. Okay, then this is a quasi ordering and it is coarser than the P of P simulation. So if you would have a P optimal proof system, its information efficiency would be in a sense optimal in the sense that no proof system can have better information efficiency function except multiplying by a constant. Yeah, so that's... Okay. I, I mean, I, I'm also wondering whether it, whether actually one could define this function, uh, whether there is some sensible limit of this which does not depend on the proof system at all. 
I mean, of course, one can define something like the Kolmogorov version of it, where you would take the size of the algorithm computing P into account, but, uh, you know, it doesn't, I, I haven't found some kind of sensible question or statement about it to, to make such a definition. Okay. And now in the last slide or one to last slide, you mentioned proof systems with advice for which- Yeah, so proof systems with advice. So this is, uh, uh, yes. Yeah. You proved so the existence of something which we, so, so they are defined. So in ordinary proof system, it doesn't matter whether you take this relational definition or functional. For proof systems with advice, it, it's better to take the functional definition. And the proof system simply may use some advice, which depends on the length of proof. And what we prove with Steve Cook is that there is actually a proof system with one bit of advice, which simulates, uh, which P simulates all classical cook regov proof systems and simulates all proof systems with log n bits of advice. And the simulating function would use also advice. Okay. But uh, so what do you get here? Now you can take this. So I take this proof system with one bit of advice, which polynomially simulates all classical ones. And so you would hope that the proof search algorithm for it is actually something which is, you know, better than any classical one. But unfortunately, the this, uh, well, fortunately, or unfortunately, I don't know, but uh, this universal search will actually result in in a, That you froze. Proof search algorithm which uses, yeah. So, ah, do you hear me? Something went wrong. We didn't hear the word. We we lost the last minute or two. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Last thing we heard. Last thing we heard is that. uh, uh, the, what happens with the algorithm the, that searches? Yeah, so for, yeah. so when you simply do this uh, search for you know construction of the optimal algorithm, you are actually circling over proof search uh, algorithms with different proof systems, and the advices these proof systems use would accumulate. So you would end up with a you know polynomial time non-uniform proof search algorithm, and uh, so what? I mean, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, so what? Okay. All right. Can I say something quickly? Yes, I tell me. Hi, Jan. It was a great talk. Um, Thank you very much. Take, take a while to digest it. I like the I automata, the, the lingo with the I in front, but I have, I have a more serious question. So, um, just a little curious how you came up with this notion of information. Um, I mean, well, can you give some observation about you wanted it to be instance specific, but yeah, if you could say something about why other measures like well, shoot. yeah, so this is what I was uh, trying to, which I was first not sure whether I should mention these very naive considerations that one should one should compare algorithms where they are actually doing something, you know, to on instances, and then simply some line of thought led to this notion i it, actually probably it was a random sort <laughs> but yeah so but i think it's um, you know it's it's like with kolmogorov complexity of course it's not substantially different than from talking about algorithms but it gives you a certain perspective different perspective on some problems and especially the fact that you can look at things individually rather than having them as part of some ambient sequence. And whether or not this uh, will help to anything, I don't really know, but I I think that to find out a good problem is the problem which I formulated at the end. Yeah, I wonder if the other measures could be interesting too, maybe for random formulas or for distributional settings. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, yeah, I really don't know. I mean, I, I think that people who actually work with such algorithms, they can't really agree on, on which to test them, right? 
it's kind of very ad hoc and uh, it's not really mathematically principle uh, theory behind the testing of or comparing two algorithms. It's some kind of competition and uh, experts agree that it's fair right on these examples, but there doesn't seem to be some theory behind it. And uh, I think that uh, it probably depends on the purpose for which these algorithms are used and in the environment type of problems they get and so on. But, uh, Okay. Any other questions or discussion or comments? Well, I guess we'll, we'll end up here. Th thank you again, Jan, and also Susanna. Well, for thank you, and I'm, I apologize again for being so late. So, and uh, as a reminder, the Gather Town link is available in the chat window if people want to come afterwards and, and meet up there. So I uh, hope, hope to see some of you there. Okay, thank, bye, thank bye. You. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye.